morning, church, and happy 2020. Um, man, that is so hard to say. Um, I can remember, and, and go back with me, if, if you're my age or above, for the rest of you, just humorous for old people for a second. Um, I can, man, I, I was thinking about it yesterday. Do you remember when 1999 became 2000? Uh, you remember how incredibly panicked we were and we filled our bathtubs up with water? Does anybody remember this? Then we turned our computers off and we unplugged them and we took our stocks out and we put it all in the safe because so we thought that the world was going to end. Well, I got news for you. We made it. Uh, we made it to 2020. Um, and here's the thing. Man, I'm so excited about the new year because there's this idea of every year when our calendars turn when january hits there's just this newness uh there's this feeling of newness there's this freshness when the christmas tree finally gets put back in its rightful place in the attic and all of the decorations get removed there is a freshness about it, a new start. And, and here's the thing. I was talking to uh, just some of you over the holidays and, and throughout all of December, and it just seems like for some reason, man, for your family, 2019 was a tough year. It was a tough year. And, and honestly, I think that, that probably half of us, maybe even 60% of us in the room would kind of raise our hands and go, you know what, Matt? It really it really was. It was a hard year, whether that was kind of some family stuff that went on, or, or maybe you're kind of like my family, it was some health stuff that just kind of came crashing in, or maybe it was a job situation or a relationship that just kind of finally just went. Man, 2019 was so hard for you. You just couldn't hardly wait for that ball to drop. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You couldn't hardly wait for Ryan Seacrest to get on his way and you to get on. Sorry, we were all watching Passion, my bad. And for all of you to, to kind of move on to the new year because 2019 was tough. It was just hard. And you're looking at this new year with a fresh start and a fresh mind. You know, but there's some others of you that, man, 2019 was good. I mean, it really was, and that's okay. I mean, we don't need to hide that, all right? God blesses. God does things for us. He's a way maker. We just about got Babacostal on that one. Just a minute on the fact that, that he really is. But, but 2019 was a good year for you. Man, you saw some things happen. You saw your family kind of broke free, and, and there's some things that happened. Maybe it was in your work, or maybe it was in a relationship, or maybe it was in a job, and 2019, it was a little bit hard to see go, because you had a good run at it, you know what I'm saying? You're like, man, kind of hate to see this new year, but, but there's some motivation in it for you to go, man, I think this next year, it could be, it could be just as good as the last one. I just, for just, just something about the new year, the turning of the calendar, it's just good. I mean, it really is. I mean, in the, but there's so many just different ends of the spectrum. I mean, there's some of you in this place. I know whether you're upstairs here or online, you're one of those people that we hate. You have already made every goal for this year, and you have already cross-stitched it into a quilt that you're going to wear every night. Um, you have already started on your 1,000 burpees. I mean, you've already done a 500 of them for the week. You've already kind of got your foot into running a 1,000 miles this year, and you've listed out all of your life priorities for this next year. You're already past Abraham in your chronological Bible reading already. You've already, I mean, you're already off the sugar kind of like the sugar crash because your paleo south beach or whatever power your powder you're promoting is working and you're down five pounds already um you're you're the people we hate i'm just going to tell you for the rest of us in the room uh we don't like you all right we just don't uh because the rest of us are like goals <laughs> what are goals you know i mean you're like eh, you know i kind of made it this far i'm not worried about it but but january just brings about it brings about this freshness in our heart, it brings about this kind of time that, that we can just recalibrate a little bit. And we can kind of look at where we've come from and look at where we want to be, and we can reset some things. And, and here's what excites me is that, that we can do that individually, and we can do that in all of the things that we kind of function in our own life, but we can also do that as a church. And, and can I just tell you that my prayer for the beginning of this new year, for January into February, is that this first series that we're launching into, 
that this first series means so much more to us than our new kind of plan or our new exercise regimen or my new kind of priorities. But here's my prayer in talking about the life that is set free. My prayer is that it sets us on a trajectory that for the rest of our lives, that we can sit in, that we can enjoy, that we can walk in, and we can just rejoice just over the presence of what God has done in our lives. And as a result of that, all the rest of the things that God asks us to do don't become chores. They just become part of how we can give back to Him. We're launching this new series in 2020 that really looks to this idea that God has not set us on a path of bondage, but he set us on a path to be set free. He set us on a path to be set free. And, and listen, I know, that, I know there's people in here that just, you needed to hear that this morning. I mean, not for like a weird sense of like, I got this message, your name or anything, but just in a general sense, I know that there are people in here this morning that needs to hear the life breathing message that Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, has come to set you free. In fact, John 10.10, 10, kind of if you want a theme verse for this series, it would, it would probably be this one. John 10.10 10 says this. It says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said this. It's Jesus talking. We know that. It's in red. But Jesus said, I've come to give life. And I've come that you may have it to the full. To the full. And, and man, I just can't tell you how much this is burning in me. Because I'm walking with a lot of you right now. And you need to know that there are two cosmic roles that are happening on this planet right now. You have got Satan that wants to squash you, that wants to depress you, and wants to push you down. But you've got Jesus that is on this side that wants to do what? He wants to give you life. He wants to breathe his life into you, his hope into you, his message into you. I love how Paul says it in Galatians 5.1. He says, for it is, for it is freedom. For it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Man, I'm just, man, I'm resting on this idea that God has not led us into a relationship with him to put us into bondage. He's put us into a relationship to give us hope, to give us life, to give us his life-breathing power. So as a church, what we're going to do over the next six weeks, so here's the deal. you got to come back. you got perfect attendance for the year so far, so let's just keep this thing going, all right? If you use it at home, hey, we'll count it, all right? You're there, all right? For the next six weeks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look, we're going to look at what happens when God sets us free. What are some of the motivators? What are some of the kind of core principles or follow, followers of Jesus have that are really and truly gifts that God has given us in order to set us free? And here's my prayer for this whole series. My prayer for the whole series is, is if we begin to see ourselves as not depressed little Christians, but set free, then our mindset will change to what Christ has done for us and how he's doing it. And when that happens, other people will see us, and they'll see the hope in us. Listen, and they'll want part of it. Do you see how this works? Man, I've prayed through this so much over the holidays. And, and, and even before that, on kind of this first series out of January, because I know it's an important one. I mean, some of you, you're kind of, this is part of your New Year's deal here. It's kind of like going to the Y in January. Super crazy, but give it till February, right? People are gonna, people are gonna kind of go away. But, but here's why this is so important to me. There's, there's kind of these three underlying messages. These are not in your notes. This is just for free, all right? But there's these three underlying messages that, that I just couldn't shake that has molded this whole series. And the first one is just this idea that my relationship with Jesus brings freedom and not captivity or not defeat. 
My relationship with Jesus, when I step into a relationship with him, everything I read in scripture all says freedom and not defeat, but also my salvation is only the beginning point of that. You see, when we give our lives to Christ, so many of us have this opinion or have this mindset in our lives that that is the end of my spiritual walking, that I've arrived at something, that I've done something, that I've won the prize. But Jesus is going, no, 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 no. That's the beginning of the life set free. That's the beginning of me reaching down into the miry clay, setting you on the rock as why? So that you can realize, here's my third kind of reason for this series, that we're an active part in God's plan. You're an active part. Listen, I know, I know the PTA loves you. I know whatever sports club you're involved with loves you. I know that your tennis group, if you don't bring those snacks tomorrow night, that they're going to fail. But listen, the church needs you. The church needs you to be a life that is set free to the point to where I'm looking at Jesus and I'm just giving him my life. So look, if we put those three statements together, what this whole series is kind of wrapped around is this idea that I can truly see myself, listen to this, as not a depressed little meek Christian that's just trying to get this world to get off my back, but I can see it as a purposed person that is set free, that is powered by God, that has been given full satisfaction and freedom and worth, that God is looking at me saying, listen, you're mine. Can I just tell you, if you've given your life to Jesus in this room, there is no reason, there is no reason to live a defeated life. There's just not. No matter what this world throws at you, he has set you free. He said, this is a theme of the Bible. And look, I know some of us grew up in incredibly fundamental churches that never wanted you to know that you could be free because they always wanted to keep you in this kind of heaviness of this rules-driven rules Christianity. But, but let me just read you, all right? This is not kind of normal sermon deal. So if you're here for the first time, this is not normally how it works. But, but let me just give you some verses. I can't say it better than these people. I mean, the Holy Spirit inspired them to write it. All right, here it is. 2 Corinthians, verse 3. says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom. What does that say? When the Spirit comes inside of us, we are now free to live as God's created us to live. John 8, 31. These, th this is so good. If you hold to my teachings, Jesus said, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in other words, the Spirit sets us free in God putting it inside of us. The truth of God that we're holding in our hands digitally or on paper, old school, all right? Either way, that sets us free. But keep going, John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're seeing that freedom is a theme of the Spirit. It's the theme of the Scriptures. It's the theme of the Son of God stepping into our lives. And listen, I can read all of these, and there's so many more. I mean, we, I thought about just getting up here and reading all 700 verses about freedom from the Bible, but you ain't coming back after that happens, all right? I read all of these verses, and, and I have to ask myself, why do we see so much freedom? Why do we see so much freedom in the Bible? Listen, but yet we as Christians live defeated lives. Why is that? Why is it that we, Jesus followers, for some reason, we live like we're losers in the end? I, I got news for you. I read the last book. We win. We win. God wins. He sets us free, especially for those 13 people that clap. He sets you free. <laughs> That's the message. That, 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 hey, probably, hey, you guys upstairs, I bet every one of y'all clap because we love y'all more, all right? <laughs> That's the message of this series. The message of this series is that God has set us free and that we should celebrate every single day of our lives as if we're walking side by side with the one who has set us free think about it just for a minute and i know this is going long this is just setting up these next week if you're a follower of jesus in this room if you're a follower of jesus listening to this message you are as close to hell right here on this earth as you will ever be as you will ever be 
Listen to this, believer. Your salvation is not resting on your performance. It's just not. If it was, we would never be here. Some of you have lived that life, and you just didn't make it. We weren't intended to make it like that. Listen, you cannot change God's opinion of you. Do you know why? Because he already loved you at your worst. He already loved you at your worst. He loved you when you could not love him back. He's already loved you. Listen, you have a loving God that has brought you from death to life, and this should motivate you. It should excite you. It should put you on another plane that the world doesn't understand, and it should begin to set a different path for not just 2020, but for the rest of our lives. So this morning's mark of the life set free kind of sets up the rest of them. This morning's mark that we're going to look like or kind of indication that we're living a life that's being set free by Jesus is simply this. We should be motivated by the gospel. We should be motivated by the gospel, that we should, or our lives should be motivated by the gospel. Let me say it a different way. Our primary motivation in life how we live, how we speak, how we work, all of our relationships is, here it is, here's where it gets heavy, it is nothing more than a response to what we think the gospel is worth. It's nothing more than a response. Every single word that I say, every action I have, everything I do in my life is nothing more than a motivation that is inside of me that is displaying the worth that I give the gospel that I give the gospel. Here's why, all right? Here's why this works. It's because motivation is an incredibly funny thing. We're always motivated to do what we think is the best thing for us. Let, 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 me, let me give you an example. Here, here's what I know. Um, remember, remember when you first started dating? Remember some of you, maybe later. Um, remember when you first started dating? You remember you would, you would drop everything when that person called, would you not? I mean, remember you used to have to pull that cord into the pantry uh, and, and get it? No, I'm just kidding, I'm not that old. Uh, re- remember, uh, remember what you would do? I mean, it was almost like you didn't even have any other friends because if, if you did have friends, they came way behind that person. Why? Because that was, that was what you, you were worried. I, I remember when Melissa and I were dating. Um, when, when we were dating, we were in college, and, and we decided to go up to Dahlonega to visit kind of the town to visit one of my great aunts. I'm talking like old as the hills. Great aunts in Dahlonega. She was probably about 85 years old at the time. And we went, and we decided, hey, we were poor college students. We decided, why don't we go eat lunch with them? That was a horrible idea. She lives in the mountains of Dahlonega, and we just popped in for lunch, kind of called ahead, said, hey, we're going to come. And I remember walking in to this place into her house for lunch and I mean this is a modest little mountain house they moved up there to be away from people it's that kind of people you know what I'm talking about so we walked in and I just remember going "Ooh, that's a funny smell uh, that I'm not really sure that I know what that is this could be interesting and so we came in we sat down at the table and I can remember my great aunt bringing out this big old platter full of the biggest nasty Bratworth hot dogs that had been boiled to death and putting them on the table and I'm going oh this is going to get interesting really really fast this is and I can just look at Melissa and she's just shaking her head like "Uh uh-uh nope this is not going to happen I'm like well let's see and then she went back into the kitchen and she brought out the biggest platter of homemade sauerkraut I mean strong homemade dripping off the platter sauerkraut and she slammed that down on the table and I'm looking over at Melissa going oh this is not going to be good right here I'm just going to see how this is going to work and then so we're at the table and if it couldn't get any better it did Uh, my aunt stands up and she makes Melissa a hot dog Uh, she makes her a bratwurst. I'm like, oh, she don't even get to make her own. No, 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 that's not how it works in this house. So she takes out one of these big old dogs. I mean, it was like this big. And she puts it on the little bitty bun. And then she just scoops out just a big old piece of, I mean, I don't even know, is it not a piece of sauerkraut? I don't even know what it is. And just slaps it on there, puts some mustard on it. Melissa hates mustard also. Puts some mustard on that thing, and she slides that plate over, and I'm like, oh no, oh. And so all of a sudden, I'm thinking, she's going to find a new ride home. It's not going to be with me. I don't know what's going to happen. She might just walk out this door. But then I remember, so she sat there and looking at it, and I don't know if she's just praying for God to take away her taste buds. I don't know what's going down. But then she gives me mine. We pray and then we get into the middle and I look over and Melissa ate the dumb hot dog. 
She ate it. It was the nastiest thing. I can eat a cardboard box and not care. But I mean, I was choking this thing down just to be a good family member. But I remember she ate this stupid hot dog. And I'm going, what is your problem? Just say no to drugs. I mean, don't do it. Uh, Don't give in to peer pressure. But I looked at her and I realized something in that very moment was this. She was motivated because she wanted to be with me. Oh, hey, that, was your, that should be your next response right there, okay? She was motivated. Now she'd be like, get that nasty junk out of my life, all right? Now she'd be like, nah, I'm out. Uh, y'all call an Uber, I'm leaving uh, now. But back then, back then, she was just motivated to make a good impression. Here, here's what I know about us human beings. Given the right motivation, we will do just about anything. We will. That's why people give up their lives. That's why people fight for people. That's why people do things that they never said that they would do. That's why people become things in college or late in their high school career that they said they would never become. Because what was put in front of them as motivation is now worth something to them. And they rise to the top. So the question is, what is worth the most to me? That's where we're going this morning. The principle that we're looking at this morning is that what we assign the most value to, what we assign the most value to always wins. There's your principle for the day. What we assign the most value to, it always wins. This is how Jesus talks about the gospel. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 45, he says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy he went out, he sold everything that he had, and he bought that field. Did anybody tell him to do it? Did anybody beg him to give some money? Did anybody beg him to turn in all he had? No. He did it out of the joy of his heart. Why? Because there was something in the field that was worth it to him. Verse 46, when he, I mean, verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and he bought it. Can I tell you the moral of these two stories is not buying farmland or finding some pearls. The moral of these two stories is that the gospel, that the kingdom of God, it's worth it. It's worth it. And here's what I'm just begging you to kind of get your arms and your teeth into today is this. When we understand the worth of the gospel, everything else in our lives falls into place. Everything does. The things that used to drag us don't become so prominent anymore. I love this idea. I love it because when we catch this, we live a life that is set free. The gospel is worth it. I love the fact that when the gospel becomes prominent in our lives, everything else in our lives just begins to point at it. Nobody tells us to. Nobody begs us to. Nobody even has to remind us to because when something is of value, you will always chase after it. But here's also the thing. If you're not finding yourself chasing after the gospel, it's it's, it's a value problem. It's a value problem. So it goes both ways. Let me define the gospel because I think this, this, I know some of you are new to the church world. I know that maybe this word is a tough one for you. I, and I'm going to use J.D. Greer's definition out of his book called The Gospel. It works, all right? Here it is. The gospel is the announcement that God has reconciled us to himself by sending his son Jesus to die as a substitute for our sins. Now, now, pause there. There's a whole lot. That could be a whole series right there. All that is saying is this. The gospel is this announcement. It's this act that God has brought us back to himself through Jesus coming to the earth, living the sinless life, dying on the cross, rising on the third day, Die in the death that I deserve. That's what it means, that God is bringing us back. There's nothing that can bring us back to God other than what Jesus has done. And here's our response to it. And that all who repent and believe have eternal life in him. Have eternal life in him. So here's what this implies. This implies three things about the gospel. The gospel works in three areas of our lives. At first, the gospel works as the foundation for our salvation. 
It works as the foundation. It's the message. It's the good news. It's what you've been taught if you've gone on a mission trip to share the gospel, to teach the gospel, to give people the gospel. That's what the gospel is. It is the evangelistic end or this offer that God wants to redeem us and make us right before him through Jesus. That's the first part. But also, number two, the gospel forms up our sanctification. It forms it up. Now, let me define sanctification. Somebody in the first service wrote it on their hand so they could ask me what it meant. Sanctification literally means this. It's the becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. It's a process. We start it at salvation. It is not fulfilled till we walk with Jesus one day. And what the gospel does to us, it's the mold of our sanctification. We're poured into it. Our life is shaped by it. It's the lane that we drive in. It's the concrete mold mold that the concrete is poured in. It is saying it's the life-giving message that gives us shape. This means that the gospel is not just our ticket into heaven. It's a whole new basis of how we relate with God, with others, with ourselves. I love how J.D. Greer says it in his book, The Gospel. You should probably read it. It says this, the gospel is not merely the diving board in which you jump into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is the pool itself. Man, I love that. Why? Because the gospel is what shapes my worldview. It shapes my decisions. It shapes who I have conversations with. It shapes my relationships. It shapes how I use my money. It shapes how I live my life. It shapes what I watch and what I listen to and what I wear. And what it does is the gospel is what gives all of the shape to that, number two, but also number three, here's what the gospel does. The gospel, it's the fuel for my future motivation. It's the fuel for my future motivation. So you're seeing it. The gospel begins my salvation. The gospel forms up and gives it direction. And the gospel is the fuel that, listen to me, one day it'll all be fulfilled. It'll all be fulfilled. The gospel is so much more than just the saying that we tell people on a mission trip. The gospel is so much more than a prayer that you pray to invite Jesus into your heart. The gospel carries this encouragement that God is never going to leave me or forsake me. That God is always going to walk by my side. That God is going to give me eternal life. Catch this, with him. That's the message. I love how Paul sums up the gospel in Galatians 4. In Galatians 4, Paul says it like this, verse 4 through 7. He says, but when the set time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption into sonship. You can put daughtership there. It's okay. Because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now catch verse 7, because here's your motivation. So you are no longer a slave. But you are God's child. And since you are his child, you have been made an heir. Do you, do you, do you kind of grasp what that's saying right there? I can't do enough cartwheels to do anything better than this, all right? Here's what this is saying. No longer are you just a slave. No longer are you just a child of God. But you are a full heir. You've been given full rights because of what Jesus has done for you. And if this doesn't motivate us, I don't know what does. I don't know what can motivate us anymore because we did not deserve what Jesus did for us. We didn't deserve any part of it, but he gave us life. He adopted us. He set us free. Listen, here's what this is telling me. We are not motivated by a bunch of thou shalts and thou shalt not. It didn't work in the Old Testament, and it's not going to work in our lives. We're not motivated by a bunch of rules We're not. We're motivated by the amazing offer of the gospel that has brought us into life, that has shaped our lives, and that one day we'll fully know all of it. That's the motivation. It's almost like he's telling you, I'll give you a billion dollars, but you've got to wait until you're 60 years old and you can never wear the color red. You wouldn't wear red. But yet for some reason with the gospel, we don't see it with that kind of reality and motivation. But Jesus is offering it to us. All of the elements of the gospel, they're not just for unbelievers. 
They're for believers to motivate us. It's not just how we start in Christ, it's how we live in Christ. Listen, church, the life that is set free is not changed through external pressure or by laws. It's changed through internal transformation of me seeing and abiding in what Jesus has already done for me. What he's done for me. So can I just tell you to quit trying harder? Quit. It doesn't work. Your growth in Jesus does not start with you doing good for God. It starts from you hearing what good God has already done in you. Does that make sense? Some of you grew up in churches and in backgrounds that all that was pressed into you was do right, do right, do right, obey, obey, obey. That's not where you start. You start by putting something of worth in front of you called the gospel. And when you grasp the gospel, everything else in life begins to funnel into this mode of what Jesus has done for us and what he's given us. See, growth in Jesus doesn't come from just learning and doing more. It comes from seeing what Jesus has done for us and plunging ourselves into the gospel. So what does all this look like? Let me give you six quick ways this morning. Let me give you six quick things that happen when we are motivated by the gospel. Let me give you six indicators because here's the deal. Here's what I know. Some of you are like, man, give me the list. Give me the list. I'll work the list, all right? Here's your list. Some of you are like, nah, I'm good. Got it. I'm out. <laughs> Let me give you a list. What does it look like when we're motivated by the gospel? What's the byproduct? Number one, I surrender the lordship of my heart. I surrender the lordship of my heart. Why? Because I realize what Jesus has done for me. And when I realize he has done something for me that I could have never done for myself, I have to give him control. The word Lord literally means he is in control. When Jesus, when the, when the gospel motivates my life, I set my eyes on the gospel and I give him the lordship. Why? Because he's already set me free. He's already set free. But number two, when I'm motivated by the gospel, I redefine the central, the central focus of my life. I redefine the central focus of my life. Do you know what happens when the gospel motivates me? My goal becomes no longer satisfying myself. Can I tell you, what happens is my motive moves from fulfilling my desires to now I'm fulfilling Jesus' desires and his goals, and his love, and his ideals, the temptations, the ideals, those things that used to mean the most to me, what happens when this happens? They begin to be put into the shadows. They begin to be put in the shadows. This is the song that so many of us grew up with, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. This is what it's telling us, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the Things of earth will what? Will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, when we're motivated by the gospel, the things that used to fuel us, that used to give us life, we just see them now as temporary blips on the radar. It's not going to work. Here's number three. When I'm motivated by the gospel, I experience a true, here it is, a true fulfillment in my soul. But it's a process. I give him the lordship. I change my focus. And then at that point in my life, there becomes to be a fulfillment that my soul has longed after my whole life, but I didn't know where to point it to, right? Our souls need fulfillment. I mean, really and truly, lack of fulfillment in life is near the root of every sin that we commit. It really is. Why do people cheat? Why do people abuse drugs? Why do people mindlessly binge watch ridiculous amounts of TV? Why do they scroll endlessly on Facebook and Instagram? And why do they steal? Why do they commit suicide? All of these things revolve around the fact that people have not found fulfillment. They haven't. And I got news for you. You're not going to find it in these things. Why? Because we've been created to be in a relationship with the Father through the gospel. Through the gospel, it's our motivation in life. Psalms 107, verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul, he fills with good things. Psalm 16, 11, In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at the right hand are pleasures evermore. Did you know that God wants to fulfill you? He wants to. He wants to fulfill you more than you even want to be fulfilled. 
He wants to give you, he wants to fill you with his love, with his security, with his significance, with his peace, with his purposes, with his future. But listen, if you want fulfillment, the gospel has to be the motivator and not what culture says you should be chasing. It's not going to work. It's just not. Here's number four. When my life is motivated by the gospel, I find myself, I find myself being drawn to things of God. I just find myself being drawn to them. Here's the difference. Most of us grew up in places that said, you better drive yourself to God. You better run to God. You better love God, and if you don't, whatever. Follow the rules. Here it is. You see, when the gospel becomes my motivator, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit begins to draw me ever so more into the things of God. Can I guarantee you something? If over the next 30, 40 days of your life, if you will spend intentional time in the word of God and in prayer by yourself, the things of God will become sweeter to you. His voice will become louder. The Holy Spirit will become more a figure in your life and he will begin to speak to you. James 4, 8, it says, if you will draw near to God, what does it tell us? He will draw near to you. You see, when the gospel is our motivator, when we begin to see what Jesus did, it begins to draw us in to him. You'll begin to see your life change, your desires change, you'll develop a hunger that comes from, okay, I have to do it, to now, okay, I want to do it. Do you see the paradigm shift? The shift that we've preached for so long has been, you better obey, you better do, you better do this. What if we tasted the gospel just a little bit stronger? I guarantee you we'll run back for more. I guarantee you the Holy Spirit's prompting will become more clear in your life. And nobody will have to tell you to pray. Nobody will have to tell you to read the Bible. Nobody will have to tell you that church matters anymore. Why? Because the things of the earth will go strangely dim. The lordship of God is in his place. My focus is in the right spot. I'm being fulfilled by who he is. I'm becoming, here's number five, I'm becoming a useful messenger of God. I'm becoming useful. Why? It's logical, right? We speak all about what's worth to us. What's worth the most? You ever met anybody that just got engaged? You almost got to tell them to shut up. You ever met anybody that had a first kid? All they want to do is show that kid off. By number three, four, don't even remember their name. But the first one, you know what I'm talking about, right? Can't even, can't even get them to be quiet about it. You don't have to tell them to promote their kid. Why? It's worth something to them. It's the motivating factor of their lives. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians verse nine, uh, verse chapter 9, verse 23. He says, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. He's saying, I become all of these things. I serve people. I live for people. I give up my own desires. I do all of this, Paul says. Why? For the sake of the gospel. No one has to beg you to serve Jesus when your life is motivated by the gospel. Here's the last one, number five. It's the shortest one I got. Or number six. When my life is motivated by the gospel, I store up treasures in heaven. I store up treasures in heaven. You see, you can't take this stuff with you that we're chasing after. You really can't. And I got news for you. You're going to get old one day. We all are. One step at a time. But can I tell you this? The things that matter never go away. It's the things that God has called us to live in. I love Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. Listen to what Jesus said. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves can't break in and steal. Listen to this last one. It ties all this in together. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What if, what if this church began to treasure the gospel? What if this church began to look at the fact that we are a group of redeemed people only through the power of Jesus. What he has done for us and what he is going to do for us. What if our affections and our attentions begin to shift from the things that culture says that we should drive into and begin to shift to the thing that we're most to us and it's the gospel of Jesus. I'll tell you what happens. 
treasure moves to Jesus. And our life begins to point to Jesus. And our hearts begin to point to Jesus. And people begin to see Jesus living in them. And habits that we had begin to be broken. And troubles that we've been walking in begin to be set free from us. The chains that we brought from all these areas of our lives begin to be taken off of us. The marriages that are being broken begin to be healed. The kids that we're just having incredible troubles with begin to see a new life in us. And when all of this happens, Jesus gets the glory, but we receive the bountiful joy of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord. See, the gospel is the motivator. It's not a thing. It's nothing else. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, this morning, we just ask you to incredibly impress and sear onto our hearts that you, Lord, are worth it. Lord Jesus, if people in this room need to give their hearts to you today, I pray that during this next invitation song that they see this is not a time to beat the crowd to the parking lot, but they see this as a time to begin a process of being motivated by the life-giving power of the gospel. But God, for those that don't know you in this room, God, this, during this time, my prayer is that they meet you. They simply step out from wherever they're at. They come to the front of this room and they look at one of us and just say, I need Jesus to come into my life and we will walk them through what it looks like to have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for others in this room that need you, Jesus, to bring them back to that moment of salvation, that need to reshape them and mold them into a life that is pointing towards the gospel being a motivator. I need those, Jesus, I need you to speak to those in this room that have for so long chased after so many things of this world that you have grown them, that God, today your gospel would reign in their hearts. Lord, if people need to join this church today, I pray they step out from wherever they're at and come tell one of us in the front and we'll let them know what those next steps look like. Lord Jesus, work in our hearts.